Welcome to Congressional Connector TV with your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. The eye will head home and look family straight in the eye and say the federal government is on your side, providing support during this downturn and making key investments for the future. And now here's your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. Thanks for joining me. My guests today are Scott Paul, Executive Director of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, proud to say that, American Manufacturing, and Clyde Prestowitz, another friend of mine, founder and president of the Economic Strategy Institute. So no one will be surprised with the two of you here today that our topic is American Manufacturing and Trade. It's a topic we all agree is essential for American prosperity. But as important as it is, too often it's been neglected because of a naive belief that if left alone, everything would work out well. We know that hasn't happened. So I want to talk manufacturing with you today and specifically about the ideas contained in a new book that both of you worked on, Manufacturing a Better Future for America, and it's in red, white, and blue. And I think uh, for good reason. So, Scott, why don't you kick this off? Why this book? It's a good question, and thanks for having us on to talk about this issue. I don't need to tell you, you how important manufacturing is. You know. But I think a lot of Americans have lost touch with the fact that it's an important aspect of our economy that's both faced dramatic decline uh, and faces incredible challenges. Uh, I, I don't <coughs> think most people know that one of the precipitating causes for uh, the financial collapse we saw last year was in part because we have such a gross uh, global imbalance, especially with China. Uh, and in part of that is because of manufacturing and how Chinese competition has affected manufacturing in the United States. So we thought that we would, at the Alliance for American Manufacturing, collect some of the best minds from around the country. And we, get, we have uh, great thinkers like Clyde Prestowitz, who's sitting beside me. Uh, we got Jim Jacobs, who's the president of Macomb Community College, uh, and I know is a friend of yours, uh, to write a chapter about skills and training. But to give kind of a 360 degree view of the challenges that face manufacturing today, and also the opportunities that we have and that policymakers have uh, to make it a bigger part of the economy and to regrow it, both in terms of employment and GDP. Well, Clyde, you're one of the distinguished participants. Why did you decide to join in? You have a long history when it comes to manufacturing issues and trade issues. Sandy, I feel like <coughs> you and I have been working on this problem for as, as long as we've been around. Um, I share Scott's and yours and your um, concern about the importance of manufacturing and what's been happening to manufacturing. Uh, my chapter in the book deals with the impact of trade and trade policy on manufacturing. And I particularly wanted to do that because for a very long time, our trade policy, and I would broaden that to say our globalization policy, has really been biased against manufacturing. Uh, and so we have created a, um, a global economic structure and policy framework which effect in which effectively all of the incentives are to move tradable manufacturing abroad. And of course, that's what we've been seeing for a very long time. Uh, and so I wanted to make some contribution to redressing that balance. Good. Let's follow up that point and talk about what's been happening to mm -hmm. manufacturing as a sector of the economy. And if we take a quick look uh, at the history of where we've been and where we're headed, uh, no better way than, than a chart is the percentage of GMP that I think uh, now shows here. And look at this decline in, what, uh, 40 years, 48 years, from 25% of GDP down to, wow, 12%, um, 13%? About 11, actually. 11. Yeah. And that decline 
uh, has really increased very much. Actually, it went up in a few years, as we can see from the chart, and then it declined, and then it became somewhat stable, and now it's uh, fallen uh, more and more. So let's talk a bit more about that, uh, Clyde. What? Uh, <coughs> why? What do you think? Uh, I think there are th uh, two major factors. One is we have to recognize that manufacturing as a percent of GDP has declined. And that's gross, to pro uh, gross uh, domestic product. Right. right. Has declined in all uh, developed countries, all industrialized countries. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because as an economy becomes more advanced, it, it uh, develops more of a service component. Uh, and particularly in uh, recent years, we've seen manufacturers actually outsource some of their uh, service attributes. So for example, a manufacturing company that used to do its legal work in-house may close its legal office and source that out. Uh, and that contributes also to shrinkage in manufacturing. But I think the key point is that if you looked at that same chart in Japan or in Germany or even in France, uh, almost any other industrialized country, the slope would be much flatter. Uh, France today has about 17% of its GDP in manufacturing. Japan is about 25. Germany is about 28. So all of those countries have held on to a much bigger piece of manufacturing than we have. And so you say, why is that? And it comes back to the point I made earlier. Uh, those countries have focused on manufacturing as an important source of productivity, the most important driver of productivity in their economies, the most important funder of research and development, the most important source of innovation. And they have developed policies, so they don't allow their currencies to become uh, unbalanced. They don't allow financial uh, investment incentives, such as special tax holidays and special capital grants that are offered by countries like China or Singapore or Israel to lure their manufacturers away. We do. Uh, and so again, we have set ourselves up so that the incentives in our economy, if you're a manufacturer and if you make something that's tradable, the incentive is to move the production someplace else. Now, I think such a key point, and to look at other countries. <coughs> we, we got into this, I think, uh, this verbiage. We were in a post-industrial era. Yeah, right. And uh, we've we we suffered. We've we had a mantra. The mantra was that <coughs> we had two mantras. <coughs> One mantra was that uh, free trade uh, and by free trade, I think it's important to, to explain that there are two different understandings of free trade. When you and I talk free trade, or if we talk to the average guy on the street, we assume that free trade means that we open our market and they open our market, their market. But to economists, free trade means that regardless of what the other guy does, you open your market. So free trade really to economists means unilateral free trade. One-way trade. <coughs> One-way trade. Is and, free trade. And we've had this mantra that free trade is going to make everybody rich, and as countries become rich, they become democratic, and if they're democratic, they'll be peaceful. Uh, and the second mantra has been, don't worry about those manufacturing jobs. They're sweaty and they're dirty, and we're going to move to higher ground. We're going to do the sophisticated high-tech design. We're going to do the investment banking. We're going to do the uh, consulting and all the sophisticated services. That's been the mantra. And we need to get back to this notion that there is no connection between manufacturing and high tech. But before we do that, let's now look at a chart on manufacturing and employment that really says something about the issue of jobs. Because we're into retraining and training, and Michigan has been in the lead, and, and to its credit, to our credit. But uh, there's, there's a notion that, that people have just trained and retrained without relationship to jobs. So let's look at this chart on manufacturing employment, and look how it's dropped in terms of uh, the number of employees. Now, I think picking this up 
Scott, you might want to comment mm -hmm. on just this precipitous drop sure. and what it's meant. Yeah, I, I think there's two points that, that, this, uh, that this chart shows that, that uh, it, it, most people don't appreciate. One is that manufacturing has been in recession, really, for about the last decade. I mean, much of the country, I, I, everyone has experienced a recession the last 20 months or so. But manufacturing has been in recession for about the last decade. And over that period of time, we've seen manufacturing employment drop from 17 million to 12 million. We've lost 5 million manufacturing jobs. That's al almost a third of all manufacturing employment has disappeared over the last decade. Um, and it didn't have to be that way. Coupled with that, we've lost 50,000 factories over the last decade. So this isn't simply a matter of automation and robotics and productivity taking the place of workers and pushing them out of the workforce. Uh, it's also <coughs> a, a lot about globalization and competition, and especially import competition from China over the last decade uh, that we've seen, and the rules not being fairly applied, which I, you know very well as the, as the chairman of the Trade Subcommittee. Now, before this, and I think this is the important point, you can see from the chart that manufacturing employment actually held pretty steady with some peaks and valleys uh, for about two decades. And uh, the, the point about that is that a, a decline in manufacturing employment is not inevitable. Um, it's not desirable, but it's not inevitable. And if you if you listen to some uh, economists or uh, some ideologues on this, uh, they'll 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 say, as Clyde suggested, that oh, we want to we want to get out of that, and it's inevitable that we're going to decline churning capitalism. We're going to move into other things. It's not inevitable that manufacturing employment. Uh, declines. Uh, we were able to hold it steady uh, in the 80s and the 90s through a variety of means. Some of that was exchange rate policy. Some of that was public investment uh, during the Clinton years. Uh, but there were a number of techniques we were able to use. Uh, but what we've really decided, I think, over the last decade uh, is that it doesn't matter. And we're just going to let it slide. And it's sliding now beyond really the point of no return. And we're seeing every month uh, 100, 200, 300,000 layoffs in manufacturing. And I think that you know, we may be able to stem the flow in the rest of the economy, and the stimulus will help to turn some of that around. But we're going to continue to see declines in manufacturing unless we change some of the structural things that we need to do, uh, both in our trade policy and our tax policy, but also in the rest of the economy, dealing with health care costs and a, and a number of different issues. And so much is connected with it. And you know, this battle to make sure that the big three could survive in a reduced form, true. And true, there were mistakes made uh, virtually by, by everybody. But really the critical issue was whether we were going to have an automotive manufacturing base in this country the big three, but also all the suppliers that are connected to it. And I think there was a, a, a mistaken notion that there was no connection between this and advanced technology. And I'd like to talk about it. And now there's another chart. I'd like uh, uh, all those who are listening in to, uh, to, to take a look at. And then uh, we're going to come back to uh, issues that you've mentioned, issues of trade. No, I think there's a myth that all that's happening is that people are sending shoes, toys, and apparel, and we're exporting advanced technology. I remember we had a meeting with the Trade Minister of China some time ago, and she said, look, there's no problem. We send you shoes, we send you toys, we send you apparel, and you send us advanced technology. And we said, you know, when you look at the figures, increasingly shoes, apparel, toys are a small part of what China is shipping here. And this <coughs> chart shows what's happened in terms of the trade balance in advanced technology products. Clyde, talk a bit about that. You've written about this, and it goes back to the struggle we had with Japan when they shut out our products. Right. I was talking to right. a colleague just a short time ago about my experience, and you were so much a part of this. I carried around a universal joint <laughs> 
that I bought Main Street Joe's Auto Parts, Royal Oak, Michigan, for $11.46. This was years ago. That same universal joint cost $105 in Japan. Yeah. So they were shutting us out. We couldn't right. export that to there. <coughs> and they were soaking their consumers with what, uh, 1146, 105, that's almost 10 times. So talk a bit about uh, this notion that um, there, there isn't an issue of technology in this whole battle to maintain a manufacturing base. In Good. This uh, two points, Andy. One is if you look at the chart, the chart tells an interesting story. Um, you remember that we didn't always have this breakout of our high tech trade uh, balance. Uh, back in the 80s, we just reported our trade in goods and we reported our trade in services. And actually, we didn't even, in the early 80s, we didn't even report our trade in services in the monthly report. We just reported trade in goods. Well, by the mid 80s, the number was so negative and it was looking so bad that some uh, economists said, well, but really we should include the services because we have a surplus in services and the combination of services and, and manufactured goods is a better picture of our real economic standing, particularly because we're becoming a services economy. So we included the services in the report and for a while the trade deficit was smaller. But then by the late 80s, even the trade de deficit in the combination of goods and services was so big that it was overwhelming, that the deficit in goods was overwhelming the small surplus in services. So then somebody said, yeah, but wait a minute, we're really good in high tech. We're, we're not just becoming a services economy, we're becoming a high tech economy also. We should have a special category to, re to show our trade in high tech because we have a big surplus there and that will demonstrate that we're really still superlative in high tech. So we began doing this in 1991 and sure enough, for most of the 90s we had a surplus in high tech, but now of course we're losing it in high tech as well. Uh, and for the same reasons, the, the same dynamics that have applied to textiles and shoes and steel and autos and auto parts and universal joints are also applying to semiconductors and telecommunications and cell phones and all the rest. And the dynamics are that the foreign markets tend to be closed, the American market is wide open, the uh, many foreign countries are providing special tax incentives, uh, special uh, capital grants to attract factories. Uh, Intel has just announced a $6 billion facility in China, another $6 billion facility in, uh, in Israel. And you ask yourself, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not trying to criticize Intel here. Intel's doing, I think, what makes sense, what you and I would do if we were running Intel. But it's actually not less expensive in terms of actual production to make Intel chips in Israel or in China. Uh, what makes it so attractive is that the factories in, in, in China and in Israel are going to escape taxes for a long time. The governments in those countries are putting up substantial amount of the investment cost. And so when you do the financial analysis, it actually turns out that uh, a, a semiconductor plant in China will, will uh, produce a billion dollars extra in earnings for the company over 10 years as compared to a semiconductor plant in the United States. And you hear about <coughs> this, don't you, Scott? Is you've been around this country, I know, a lot. And, and you hear the feeling that, what, we're losing it, we're not on our toes. What do you hear? It's exactly right, and I think there is this misperception. Part of the, part of the, why this chart is so important, advanced technology, is that, well, traditional manufacturing may be losing ground, but we're making it up in the high tech sphere. That's clearly not the case. And even to put a finer point on it, I mean, a lot of people have their hopes rested on a clean energy manufacturing economy, and there's great potential for that in you know batteries and wind turbines and uh, photovoltaic cell cells and LED lighting and things like that. There's a lot of opportunities for American manufacturing. But even in clean energy goods right now, we have a trade deficit. 40% of the steel that's going into the wind towers is coming from China. And it's precisely because we have these structural problems in our economy. We don't provide the right incentives to manufacture here. 
other countries do, we're really, and Clyde and I had a discussion about this last month, we're, we're, y maybe the Anglo-Saxon countries don't have a manufacturing policy, and you can argue that Australia and, and, and Canada and, and Britain might not have one, but everyone else does. And uh, Japan does, and Germany does, and China does, and Brazil does, and these are our industrial competitors. They're able to hold their share of manufacturing. They're able to attract the investment precisely because they have the right tax, the right skills and training, the right trade, the right public investment, all the right incentives they need to get manufacturing there. We have what one call describes as an anti-industrial strategy. Now let's talk about that. I'd like us to take a look at the uh, manufacturing trade deficit chart uh, that now all of our viewers can see and look what's happened. Now I, I think I want to be clear and I think you agree with this. It isn't a question of our closing off the United States. It's not an issue of building a wall around the U.S. There's no great wall when it comes to trade. The issue is the balance. The issue is whether the rules are there. The issues are whether we have policies that allow us to be part in manufacturing, part of the back and forth. I was reading an article you mentioned about energy, about solar panels. Look, we want to manufacture solar panels in this country. We have a lot of technology. We have a lot of skilled people in Michigan and elsewhere who could go into this. What China is doing is subsidizing openly their industry and their target is to dominate solar panel manufacturing in the world. <coughs> and this has raised real questions in this country, I hope, and also in Europe. The question is, we ought to be able to compete China's part of the World Trade Organization. It was inevitable, I think, they'd be part of it. But they agreed to abide by some rules. That was the, ba the battle over China tires, in part. They were swamping, coming in, elevating their, their, their exports here three times in four years. So what the, this deficit chart shows is this challenge, I think. Not that there should not be expanded trade. We need it in this world. But whether it's going to be in a, in a structure where this country is dedicated to being able to compete. That's really what you've been talking about, right? Um, we've been making this uh, same argument for about 30 years. Um, we went through it with Japan, then with the tiger, the Asian tigers, and now we're with the last tiger, it's a really big tiger, China. But I think it's also important to note that um, it's not just a China question. If you talk solar panels, for example, actually the kings of solar right now are the Germans. Uh, the Germans also are subsidizing development of their solar industry. Uh, the kings of windmills right now are the Danes. The Danes have also provided support to develop this very important technology. And I think that actually, in a way, we should be less focused on what the other guys are doing and more focused on what it is that we want to do ourselves. You know, and to and the credit of, of, of the administration and some of us who've been working <coughs> on this, we now have some impetus and some funding right. for battery right. development. Right. Right. Because, you know, GM is building the vault. The first batteries are from Korea because there weren't battery cells anywhere else that would work. Right. But now they say they want to use American products. <coughs> and so now for the first time we've stepped up to the plate and said we're going to give some basic assistance so that there'll be this development in this country. That's really what we should be well, doing. And that's a good step forward, but it's 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 a necessary but an insufficient step, Sandy, because one, the amount of, I'm, I'm glad that the administration is doing it, but the amount that they've put up so far is really peanuts compared to what's happening in Japan and Korea and some other places. Secondly, um, if you do that, but you don't deal with the uh, management of exchange rates by which uh, a lot of the Asian countries are managing their exchange rates to be undervalued as an indirect 
subsidy to their exports. If you don't deal with the exchange rate problem, if you don't deal with the tax holidays and, and the other financial incentives, um, the money that we spend to just kind of promote a little bit of R&D or a little bit of experimental pilot plant development will be wasted. So essentially what we need is a new trade framework, <coughs> a new policy. And this administration, it is my hope, will come out with it. Uh, the, the policy of the previous administration was hands off. Let it happen. It will work out in the wash. I think this administration knows we need to expand trade, but to shape its course, and that means in, in policy. I'm knocking on wood. I hope you're right. <laughs> <coughs> I think it's important yeah. that, that, that that happen. You know, we always pause uh, on these programs to see if there's a mailbag uh, ingredient. So let me just see if we have uh, um, a few questions. Gregory says, it costs General Motors Canada $8 less <coughs> per hour per employee to do business simply because Ch Canada has a public health care system. Health care costs in the U.S. have contributed to the crippling of the auto sector and reducing health care costs through the, Ameri the economy will boost the American economy overall. And we know this is true, is it not? Of course. Of course. You've been talking about this everywhere. Right. I mean, we, we health care costs cripple employers right now because they rise far faster than other prices or, or, or inflation. Couple that with the fact that producers in Germany, Japan, China, Mexico, Brazil don't face the same kind of costs as, as they do in the United States. We have to urgently do something uh, to and bring down costs and cover more. Well, and as we sit here, we're struggling with this. And, mm -hmm. and so everybody's clear. We're not talking about having their system here. Right. We're talking about having our system work and work for everybody, but work so that the costs don't <laughs> cripple our manufacturing. All right, um, I think we have just a minute left, and here's, here's a quickie from Mark, uh, Mark from Royal Oak. I'm writing to voice support for building local electric vehicle charging infrastructure to support demand for the extended range electric vehicles and EVs that some local automakers will soon be building and selling, and it's clear a lot of pieces have to fall in place, right? You've got to have a strategy and a plan. Back to your batteries. It's great that the administration is putting some money into batteries, but if you don't have the infrastructure, if you're not going to have the charging stations and all the rest of it, not going to work. It's got to be a strategy. A strategy. It's a good place to end. We need a strategy here. It doesn't mean the government makes all the decisions, not for a minute. It doesn't mean we close our walls. We've got to expand our trade, but it has to be within a strategy. And I think we've taken some steps. The Recovery Act provided some monies. We have some pieces in place, but we need a full-scale strategy. Absolutely. Well, I think our strategy is our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much uh, for joining Thank us, uh, sure, thanks Clyde for and Scott. And I think we have uh, some other questions. We don't have time. So let me just say uh, the following. If you have some further questions, uh, anybody who's listening, uh, give, us, uh, give us a call. I want to thank uh, both of you for doing that. And you can submit a question for this show, and we'll answer it, or for the next time we're around, call my office, 586-498-7122. And thanks to all of you for watching, and I hope that you'll join us next time. This has really been an interesting subject, and for Michigan, there is nothing more critical. It's jobs. It's our industrial base. We're ready for the future, a new industrial base. It won't be the same one, but there has to be a base on which we can build. Thank you, Clyde and Scott, for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you.